Taken in Creek. Scripture for this morning is from Psalm 116, verses 12 through 14. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Es-tu arracheté pour Dieu par ton sang des hommes de toute tribu, de toute langue, de tout peuple et de toutes les nations? Chong Yahan Si Dao Yiga, Nanti Ka Si Ming, Hai Ta Gun Hai Sing Ging, Yat Sek Chong Mo Gan Du Wa. Her a cool, our log, our basha, our jati. Alun a cry am al yadei alihim. Ahna met show in. Dando la bienvenida a familias latinoamericanas huyendo de pandillas y amenazas de muerte. Chúng tôi có hơn 800 nhà thơ liên minh với nhau trong nước Mỹ. No adore bon Dieu. Мы представим надломленному миру надежду и примирение Господи нашему Спасителе Иисусе Христе. And there before me was a great multitude. A great multitude. That no one. That no one. That no one. That no one could count. From every nation. Every nation. Tribe, people, and language. Standing before the throne. Before the throne. And before the Lamb. And before the Lamb. And before the Lamb. I want to see you. I want 
to see you to see you high and lifted up shining in the light of your glory pour out your power and love as we sing holy 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 to see you to see you high and lifted up shining in the light of your glory pour out your power and love as we sing holy 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 see you high and lifted up Hello, my name is Joyce Conkling. I am part of the preaching team at Hidden Creek. And I am glad to share with you today a portion of the Bible where we will learn more about Jesus. And perhaps we will come to expect a little more from him than we're presently expecting. But before we dive in, would you pray with me? Oh, Lord God, great, faithful God, eternal God. What a amazing thing that you are here with us. Lord, we're not gathered as a congregation, but you see each of us and you know what each of us needs. Lord, thank you for your care and for the Holy Spirit who can help us hear you in these verses that we're going to read. Would you please make us able and willing to hear you and follow you? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Are you ready for a question? Here it is. Have you ever wished that someone could see you? And we can all think of times in our lives when we're glad no one saw us. A time we were grouchy or had a really bad haircut. A time, just hypothetically, when we checked done next to the words, practice piano 60 minutes, when we knew we had watched TV all afternoon. We can also think of times when it probably wouldn't have mattered if anyone saw us. You know, vacuuming the car, wiping down the fridge, filling out an application for a library card. But what about times when you wished someone were paying attention? <clears throat> Maybe you learned a new skill, even recently, or got a new pet, and you wanted to show and tell. Can you think of a time like that? Or maybe you have wanted to be seen for a very different sort of reason. I'm guessing that most of us have felt lonely or isolated at some point during this past year. Maybe another time in life, your car broke down far from any city, or your bus didn't come on a day when you had somewhere important to be. Both of those have happened to me. 
Maybe you and your children were all sick at the same time and you really hoped God would send someone to help. I have several friends who respond in a clever way when I say, it's good to see you. They say, it's good to be seen. Many of the sermons that we've heard over the past few months have been about God's relationship to individuals who lived before Jesus was born. Pastor Tim has taught us about God's presence and plans for us in the waiting and difficult times of wondering, that kind of time when we wonder if anyone sees us. A few months ago, we read about Hagar in chapter 16 of Genesis, the woman who first called God, the God who sees me. And last week, Tim used the example of Joseph, also from the book of Genesis in the Bible. Joseph's life reminds us that even when we can't see God's plan for our waiting, our pain, or even just the dailiness of life, God does see us and is glad of our faithfulness and our trust in his purposes. Today, we'll be reflecting on an amazing incident that occurred when Jesus lived on earth. It's found in chapter 6 of Mark. I hope you'll follow along in your Bibles, maybe even circle some things or write some exclamation points in the margins. We'll be in Mark chapter six, starting with verse 45. The God we read about there is the same God as the one who led and provided for those people who lived long before Jesus. And he is the same God we worship and learn about right now, today. And in this passage, we find that our patient God sees us and meets us, even though our faith is still a work in progress. The event we're going to read about takes place right after Jesus fed more than 5,000 people with just five loaves of bread, little loaves, and two fish, an incredible miracle. And then this, in Mark chapter 6, 45 and 46. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Jesus took a couple of strong actions here. One. He set the disciples a task, get to rowing. These students and companions of his might have protested a bit. Surely they could be of use in dispersing the crowd. Or maybe they wanted to protect Jesus. And if they left in the boat, how would he catch up with them? Had he thought of that? Maybe you have questions or you've asked God questions about a plan he has made or a responsibility that he has given that you don't like or don't understand. I'm guessing that we all have. We see Jesus' second action at the end of verse 45, where we read that, of course, even without the disciples, Jesus was capable of sending the crowd home with their full bellies and the new ideas that they'd heard in his teaching. Then the verse says, Jesus went up on a mountainside to pray. Jesus, fully God and fully human, went to pray. A side note here. The gospel writers noted many times when Jesus took himself off to pray and the recorded times when he prayed or gave thanks in public as well. And in chapter 17 of John's Gospel, we can read Jesus' prayer for his disciples and for those of us who would believe in him in the future. His disciples, his students wanted to imitate him, and they asked Jesus to teach them to pray. So despite being tired, or perhaps because he was tired, 
Jesus connected with his father as he lived through the joys and the difficulties of human life. Now, before we go on with Mark 6, consider this. The idea that Jesus was God, sent to be the Messiah God's people had been waiting for for centuries, is familiar to most of us. Even if this is your first time ever watching or being part of a Christian church service, you've probably heard that Christians believe that Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of God. The fact that he was a unique teacher. That forgiveness for sin and eternal life is offered to us because Jesus died on the cross and came alive again. All that is familiar. But for the people Jesus fed, For the men in the boat and the other men and women who intentionally followed him to learn from him, as well as for the people who heard about this event shortly after it happened, Jesus as God, as Messiah, as Savior, was all brand new, and they needed some convincing. Perhaps that's why Jesus sent the little team out in the boat ahead of him, because in the next verses, we see more about Jesus' demonstration of his power and his care. Look at verse 47. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. How far can you see? I thought about this. I can see from one end of a football field to the other. If I were up high, I could probably see three football field lengths, maybe a quarter of a mile, although I wouldn't be able to make out what was happening on the other end. In my reading about the Sea of Galilee and this event, I learned that that lake is about eight miles by 13 miles at its widest point. So depending on where the boat launched, The disciples were between two and three miles into the lake when Jesus saw them in the night struggling to row. Wait, did you catch that? It was the middle of the night. In the first century, no searchlights, no faint glow or light pollution from a nearby metropolis. It was dark. There may have been starlight and moonlight, depending on the moon phase and the clouds. But it was night, and they were far away. And in verse 47, Jesus saw them. He saw them straining at the oars. Or as another translation says, he saw them making painful headway. One ancient language dictionary I checked told me that the Greek word used here for seeing could have meant both literal vision or an awareness of something. Either way, it's pretty amazing. Jesus saw them in the dark from miles away. Only God could do that. Jesus' followers then and now needed to know that Jesus is God. The next verses show even more of Jesus' deity. Let's pick up with verse 48. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Remember, our patient God sees us and meets us, even though our faith is still a work in progress. Jesus saw them, and he walked on the water to meet them. Many Westerners who have never picked up a Bible have heard about this miracle of Jesus, at least indirectly. That's because walking on water has been a common illusion for quite some time. 
We might hear it used of someone who is much admired or seems to live a clean life. Yeah, old Leroy, he practically walks on water. But Jesus actually did it. And by the way, they had been rowing for hours. So not only would he have had to catch up, but he also had to know where to find them in the dark hours between 3 and 6 a.m. No wonder they were startled when Jesus appeared walking on the lake. No wonder the conclusion they jumped to was one that would have fit their cultural superstitions. They weren't expecting to see the friend that they had rowed away from six hours earlier suddenly joining them walking on the water. And the part in the verse about his intending to pass by them would have made the original readers of this account think back to older Bible texts that they knew, where God revealed himself to Moses and to Elijah by passing by them in a planful, intentional way. You can read about those in Exodus 33 and 1 Kings 19. Apparently, Jesus' disciples in the boat weren't quite ready to make that connection. They weren't expecting him or recognizing him as the one who had created the wind and the water, so they were terrified. But our patient God sees us and meets us even though our faith is a work in progress. Look at the end of verse 50. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus, still standing on the waves, tells his followers to be encouraged, to put aside fear. He says, It is I the one they know, the one they ought to know is God and is in control. They might have heard the phrase, it is I, as God's personal name, the name which set God apart from regional gods invented by humans, the name often translated, I am. While hearing and seeing their friend revealing himself as God in word and action might not have been calming exactly, at least the disciples heard him say twice that they didn't need to be afraid. Then Jesus got into the boat and further demonstrated his deity as he settled the weather. Verse 50, then after that, verse 51. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. What happened next? They landed the boat and Jesus kept them along with him as he continued to heal and teach a new way of thinking and doing. Jesus, our patient God, sees us and meets us even though our faith is still a work in progress. The disciples had been listening to Jesus teach on a daily basis. They had seen him heal. They had watched him miraculously produce dinner for thousands of people just hours before. Yet who he was and what he could do still wasn't sinking in. Now, I don't want to badmouth the disciples. I am forgetful too sometimes of God's power, of things he has taught me about himself, of ways he has cared for me. I forget sometimes when I'm in the middle of doing the stuff of life, that almighty God, the Savior who has forgiven me and made me for his purposes, is watching. What about you? Do you forget that he is ready to meet you in your present task, even if your task feels like just rowing a boat with a bunch of stinky people you don't really get along with? Or maybe you are in a truly awful situation and wish that someone knew how stuck you are. Someone does know. The same Jesus, the same God who saw the disciples in the boat, who saw Hagar and Joseph 
and David and Mary and John the Baptist, that God sees us. Sometimes he doesn't show us the purpose of the hard aspects of our lives. And sometimes it seems from our finite perspective that Jesus is distant. But from these verses in Mark, we can be reminded that our God sees in the dark and he is present. The people who lived through Mark 6 only had a sense of Jesus when he was with them. But when Jesus rose from the grave and returned to heaven, he left the Holy Spirit to be with us all the time, with us in our burdens and with us in our joys. Jesus promised the Spirit in John 14 and in Acts 1 and in Acts 2. The life of the Spirit came to everyone who believed in Jesus as Lord and Savior. When we trust Jesus Christ for forgiveness of our sin, he gives us the Holy Spirit to help us. The Holy Spirit can give us insight into God's character. He can remind us that God rules the universe and that he is patient. The Spirit can give us peace. We read in Philippians that it is a peace beyond our understanding and that can guard our hearts and our minds. Jesus can calm us in a storm as well as calm the storm. Remember my friend's response to, it's good to see you. It's good to be seen. They don't say, I'm good to be seen as though they're all shiny and perfect. Jesus' first century disciples didn't have it all together and neither do his 21st century ones. Jesus wants us to honor him as great, yes. To be faithful to our assignments, yes. Jesus wants us to put down sinful habits and imitate him, asking for help to follow his ways, yes. But we know that our patient God sees us, meets us, and uses us, even though we are still works in progress. Let's look for him. The one who sees us is all powerful and all wise, and he loves us. I'll never 
Lord, let you go. My Savior, my closest friend, I will worship you until the very end. My Lord, until the very end, worship you. My Lord, until the very end, worship you. My Lord, until the very end. Well, Hidden Creek, remember this week where your help comes from, from the Lord who made heaven and earth. As it says in Psalm 121, he will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore.